This is Captain Jason Samayan from Tampa Fishing Outfitters and also their parent company, Lee Fisher International, which is next door. Jason uh, has been a FWC officer for nine years? I was out seven for years? Six years. Six years, yeah. FWC. He's been out and around. He knows his way around all the backcountry. And now, Captain Jason Smyon is going to show us how to catch bait, where to do it, and how to do it. All right. Captain Jason. All right. Thanks, Captain. So, catching bait is, I think, one of the most important things to talk about when we talk about fishing in the Tampa Bay area, or we'll call it West Central Florida, from maybe home of Sass all the way down to Naples. Um, like Captain Miller was saying, I'm the factory rep for a company called Lee Fisher International. You guys are in one of our, one of three tackle shops that we own. Uh, my office is next door. So I'm the rep that goes around to all over the country um, and tries to get our products, you know, sold. Our company was built on cast nets. 30 years ago, Mr. Lee started making bait buster cast nets and it's grown from there. So. It's, it's kind of close to my heart because as fishing, growing up here in Tampa, fishing with live bait is all I've really ever done. And I, I thought that's, that's all there is. Little did I know as I traveled the country, live bait fishing, especially inshore live bait fishing, is, is very small. There's not many people that do it outside of our area of Florida. Um, so it's pretty specific. And that's why I say talking about fishing in this area and not mentioning how to catch bait or fishing with live bait is, is kind of silly. So... I'm glad to be involved, and um, so live bait fishing, there's a uh, poster over here. So what we're talking about for the purposes of my talk is the scaled sardine, um, or white bait is what it's called. Greenbacks, uh, like Captain Miller said, the herring, some people call this Spanish sardine greenbacks, but for the most part, what we're after is a scaled sardine. It's a good hearty bait. Everything eats it. Um, it'll stay alive long in the, in the live well. Um, not to say that other baits up there won't work. What we're talking about here is getting white bait to our boat so we can throw a cast net on it. The idea though, and, and I wasn't here for all of Captain Moore's talk, but is in like in this picture here where we're throwing a big ball of chummers up under the tree. I don't know if you touched on that, Captain, but having that bait on the boat and being able to grab freebies, if you will, and, and injure them and throw them out under mangroves is a huge advantage to us anglers because not only can we make fish eat, but we can find out where fish are. You throw out a bunch of chummers under, under the mangroves or near the mangroves, those snook, if they're in the area, they'll, they'll show them because you'll hear the pop, you know, or in the area. Same thing with redfish. If you see a big school of redfish, you can keep them in front of your boat by throwing out chummers. So that's why this area of Florida, it's important. So, it's so important, actually, that guides, when I talk to other guides, the first thing we talk about is where the bait is. The, the other day I, I saw Captain Scott Moore, the guy who wrote a book about snook fishing, probably one of the pioneers of snook fishing. The first thing I asked him when I saw him at the expo, remember Captain, it was, where's the bait at? That's the first thing I asked. Because we know as guys, if we have bait on the boat, our, our chances of, of having a good day increase tremendously. Where to look? So grass flats is, is a good place to start. Um, for those of you that f like to fish offshore or, or fish um, kind of down in the southern part of the bay near the Skyway Bridge, bridges, piers, markers, all, all usually hold bait. Um, I do most of my fishing and chartering down in Charlotte Harbor and Boca Grande, and there aren't any bridges or piers or, or big markers. So most all the bait that we catch down there is in grass flats. So that's kind of my specialty is finding bait in the in the grass and the flats when you know maybe someone else can't find the bait that's kind of I, I don't mind putting the time in sometimes it takes me two or three hours to find bait but I know the day's gonna be much better with it so I don't mind putting the work in um, uh, but uh, here in Tampa we're lucky enough to have bait year-round at the Skyway Bridge um, it's always there if it, it, you just have to look for it sometimes in the winter it's it's not as easy to find right now I just talked to some guys this morning that every stall on the south pier had bait in it. What to look for. So when you're out on the flats uh, looking for bait, and if you, haven't, if you haven't heard about any bait being around and you're just out scouting to see if there's any, any bait around, this is, this is a, a good slide. So the first thing I do, and this is if I go to an area where I, ha I don't know there's bait and I'm looking for bait, first thing I do is I'll, I'll stop the boat. And it's important to get up early. 
Don't, don't think you can just go out and catch bait in the middle of the day. Usually, the earlier the better. Um, so about sun up, this p picture on the top left here. About sun up, I'll, I'll end up on the flat. I try to get there before the sun comes up and just turn the engine off and just sit and listen and, and use your senses. Like I said, smell, listen, uh, look around. Just kind of be quiet and let the flat kind of come to life and the bait will show itself eventually if it's out there. The other thing is to look for birds down in the bottom left. Birds will tell you everything. And it's not just for catching bait. Birds, when you're fishing, are, are, are tremendously important. If you're, if you're at an a island or an area and you don't see any life around, there's no birds around, there's no mullet around, I don't care if you have 19 power poles on your boat and $4,000 GPS, there's no fish there. There's no life there, there's no fish there. And the first sign that you're going to see is usually birds. Same thing on a flat for bait. If there's pelicans diving, or seagulls in the area or terns flying around, that's all a good sign. That means there's bait underneath them and you're in the right spot. The other thing I, I just found out uh, talking to some old timers um, is if you pull up with a flat and you see a pelican floating in the water, that means that pelican is either, is, he's either eating something and he's digesting it or he had just dove and he's trying to dry off before he can fly off. But naturally pelicans, the brown pelicans, don't want to just be floating in the water. Their natural perch is up in the trees. So if you see one on a, on a flat floating in the water, that's a good sign. That means there's bait there and he's eating. It might not be a lot of bait, but it's a good, where, it's a good place to start. It's a good, good tip. Um, the other thing is the, the picture here is you can actually, when the bait is thick, you can actually see it breaking the surface in kind of a pattern that looks like it might be raining in one area where they're just kind of pecking at the surface and, and you can see just dimpling. That's all white bait. Typically, other thread fins do that, but I guess they do that too. Uh, pinfish, other baits don't typically do that. So if you see that kind of dimpling effect or like it's raining on top of the water, that's, that's the white bait. That's what you're looking for. Um, the other, the picture of the watermelon is, is funny. If, and now that you guys have seen that, white bait smells like watermelon. If you, and when there's a lot of it on a flat, if you pull up to the flat and you start smelling what smells like watermelon, that's scaled sardines. Big balls and schools of scaled sardines. And next time you catch one, when you go out there tomorrow and catch them, grab one in your hand and smell it. And you'll be like, wow, Jason's right. That's crazy. It's watermelon. So this is a slick. This is a slick. When, when, when captains are out chumming or anybody is out chumming and we'll go over what to use the chum, the chum will actually create a slick in the water. It'll, it'll, it'll knock down the waves. And you can see in that picture, that's what it'll look like. So a trick that I use when I see other people out that have gotten to the flat before me or I'm moving, I will look at how long their slicks are behind their boat. And that'll tell me if they're, how long they've been there. If, if the slicks are a half a mile long behind somebody's boat or two or three boats, then I know that the bait is probably pretty tough because they've been there chumming for a long time. If, this, if there are, the slicks aren't that long, then usually they just needed to put a couple, you know, little bit of chum in, throw, and they're done. Long slicks, usually, if you have time, maybe move to another flat and check it out first. Yeah. Uh, there's, and then there's other techniques now that you found the bait and you found where the flat is. There's other techniques of how to catch that bait. Um, the first technique I'm going to go over is called a rodeo technique. And that's just simply... Have standing on the bow of the boat, and when you see the bait, throw the net on the bait. That's as simple as it is. The trolling motor works best because it's quieter, because the bait will spook off. And it happened this morning. I was at a fishing tournament this morning getting, getting some boats checked in, and they were, they were all out on this one flat catching bait. And all it takes is one guy to decide to do the rodeo technique, and then everybody else has to. Because what he's doing is he's moving that bait around all over the flat. So everybody else that wants to sit there and chum and draw it into him, kind of get screwed because that one guy wants to go around and he's chasing the bait around. So then everybody else has to pull anchor and, and then it's a big dance out there and it's, a, and it's a wreck. So if you see guys anchored up and you see slicks, you see guys chumming, be courteous and try to do that before you, before you move on and just start running around there. It really, another trade secret, it really makes captains mad. You know, we've gotten out there early, we're putting the work in and we see somebody coming around. Um, if the bait, if that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. But just one of those courtesy things to other fishermen. Yeah. Try to get ahead. Try to get ahead, meaning anticipate the movement of the bait if you're going to be doing rodeo. Don't 
don't follow the bait because it's very hard to get to where you're going to be able to throw it. Try to anticipate which direction the, the bait might be moving and get ahead of it and, and throw on top of it there. And then use your electronics. We all have, well, I don't have any on my boat, but, but the guys that have ni nice fish finders, you can, see, you can mark the pods of bait, and I'm sure you've seen it. Mark the pods of bait, throw on top of it, you know, use the resources you have on the boat. Uh, rodeo and technique, I'll put in the category of catching bait around bridges and piers because um, it's kind of the same technique when you're going up to a bridge. Uh, you want to use the tide under the bridge, meaning when you're, when you're anticipating where you're going to throw, just use the tide to drift you under the bridge and throw and, kinda, and then keep drifting with the tide. You know, does that make sense? If you're going to throw in, in between a stall of a bridge, stop the boat drift up to it, throw and anticipate that you're just going to keep drifting underneath the bridge. What, you, what gets people mixed up is wanting to stop and pull the net up. Let the momentum of the boat pull the net up. When you throw it on the bridge, just keep going let the momentum of the boat pull up. When you start messing around with moving around, that's when accidents happen and you run into bridges. So, all right, next uh, is sabiki rigs. I'm sure you guys all know, if you don't know what a sabiki rig is, is it's a series of small little gold hooks with feathers on them that attract bait and... Uh, it's a, good, it's a good way of catching bait. If you need hundreds and hundreds of pieces to go you know, be a, a, a snook you know, chummer under the mangroves, it's, it takes a little longer. But if you just need you know, maybe 50 or 60 pieces to go take offshore, sabikis work perfect, especially out in deeper water where the cast net might not sink fast enough to catch the bait. Um, I don't sabiki bait. I've, I do it when I can, but I don't typically. So just the knowledge I can pass on is be patient. I, Put the sabiki down there, and there's five or six hooks on a rig. Just when you feel that first tap, doesn't necessarily mean you need to pull up. There's five or six hooks. Leave it down there and try to fill that sabiki up. You'll be more efficient, and you'll get bait faster. You know, that, f that first tap, our instinct is to yank it, but you could get six or five, you know, if you just leave it down there a little bit longer. And then work different levels of the water column. There's bait that, you know, that are down deep on the bottom. There's different type of bait in the middle and di different type of bait on the top. So to get a variety of baits to use, you know, just kind of work down the bottom and then, and then don't drop it all the way down the bottom. Next time, maybe work a different column and then on the top. Um, and then bring more than one. Always bring more than one sabiki because they're going to break. Uh, they're, uh, they're designed to break, I guess. So bring more than one. I, we've made that mistake before. Where we just have one sabiki and we get two baits and it's broken and then onto artificial plugs for the day. Chumming. Chumming, this is the technique, like I said, that I use mostly where I am. We don't have structure typically down there in the Charlotte Harbor area. So this is my recipe. Recipe? So chumming, there's different varieties, and fishermen all have their own recipes, like chefs. Um, but the basic take is that there's going to be an oil involved, there's going to be a dry mix involved, and then there's going to be some kind of can mix involved. The pre-mades are, are already done. You just, just add water, or you can just throw it in dry. Um, these are very, very good, um, but just, you know, kind of, we're all fishermen, so we kind of want to do it ourselves, you know? This is kind of, the, the, I don't want to take anything away from the pre-made chums, but everybody's got their own thing. Yeah, yeah, we do. This is, actually, these are pictures of the store. Just downstairs, uh, we have the M80, uh, I think the Killer B. I think all three of those we have down there. Procure makes good oils too. So uh, Manhattan oil, Manhattan milk, or the Procure for an oil. The dry mix is kind of a vehicle to get the oil in the water. That's why we can use breadcrumbs or oats. Um, the fish food works best just because it's, it's actual tropical fish food that you feed to koi fish. Um, and it already has natural oils in it and proteins in it that, the, that bait eat anyways. So we're going to mix some oil or some milk or some Procure with a dry mix and then a can mix. You don't have to use the can mix. I like the can mix. I like Jack Mackerel. Cat food works, but cat food don't get the beefy platter cat food. Get the seafood cat food. <laughs> don't go out there with the steak and, steak and pork chops cat food. You know, they get the salmon or, they, or the fisherman's platter or whatever it's called. And then uh, canned fish, you know, jack mackerel or uh, tuna or something. Um, that's, you don't necessarily need that. I like using that just to have a little bit um, of a variety in, in the mixture. But that, that's the mix. Mix it all up to a consistency where it's kind of maybe like an oatmeal 
and then you're just going to throw in little pieces at a time until you start I'll seeing the bait. It. Okay, setting up. Um, I, there should be a slide in between that, but so as you're chumming, what you're doing is taking a little piece of that chum that we've made up and throwing it in the water, and I like flicking it off my thumb. Get a little ball in my hand and then flicking it off my thumb or off my fingers, just so it kind of sprays in the water and then all the oils kind of dissipate. Um, you don't want to, oh, I do touch on it. You don't want to chum, chum smart. You don't want to chum too long because then you start bringing in other species that aren't bait, like catfish and sharks and stingrays and snapper, um, things like that. So you just want to chum just enough to where the bait shows up and then stop for a minute and just kind of maintain what you have there to keep the bait interested. You put too much bait in the water, you're going to attract, or too much chum, you're going to attract more stuff. Um, what to look for when you're looking in the water for the bait Pinfish will probably show up first. They usually do. They're always quickest to the party. And what they're going to look like, if you haven't seen them when you're looking in the water, is they kind of dart in and stop and dart off. And they're, they kind of do 90 degree straight angles. The scaled sardines and the thread fins are going to be more wiggly, snaky fish when you're looking in the water. They're going to kind of wiggle around. And then they're also going to flash. If you're out there and the sun's kind of up, you're looking for the flashing. That way you know that the bait's in your chum and you're ready to throw. So setting up, use the wind. Uh, throwing a big cast net into the wind is not recommended unless you have to because some of them with the smaller meshes become big sails that you put out in the water. Um, so use the wind, anchor up or set your boat up where you have the wind behind your back and you're gonna throw with the wind. It's gonna help you open the net up. Uh, no swinging, I, what I do is I anchor off the back of the boat. This is our boat by the way. I anchor off the back of the boat and I'll and I chum throw and throw off the bow. No swinging means when you anchor off the back of the boat, if there's any wind, your boat is going to swing. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Your boat's going to swing in almost 180 degree, maybe not quite 180 degree. To prevent that, and I say no swinging because I don't want to chum 180 degrees. I don't want to put 180 degrees. I want to put chum in one spot and be efficient and catch bait and go pick my people up. I don't want to spend as much time as, you know, I don't want to spend hours out there catching bait. So I try to do it quickly, efficiently, get it done, get out of there. We got fishing to do. So what I do is I drop a little catch anchor off the bow of my boat. And that'll prevent my boat from swinging. That way my boat is in one spot. Nowadays they have two power poles. You stick those in the ground, you're done. Um, I don't have that. So I just drop a little catch anchor. And if you don't, that's all you need. You don't need a big heavy anchor with the chain. All you're doing is just preventing your bow from swinging in the wind. So you can just chum in one spot. Um, chum smart. Don't, when you stand on the bow, you'll notice maybe sometimes that you cast a shadow into the water. Don't chum into that shadow. The fish, the bait can see that. They might go in the chum, but they're going to dart right back out. Chum off to the side. Chum somewhere where you're not, you're, you're not chumming in your shadow. Um, don't chum too far, meaning when you're throwing those little pieces out like I'm talking about, don't throw them out further than you can throw that net because you're going to chum them up there. Uh, um, and then use the current. The next slide will show you that. So when you set up, when you got the boat set up and it's not swinging anymore, throw a sample piece in the water, a sample piece of chum, and see which way that chum's going to drift. It's either going to come towards you or away from you. So set your boat up to where you're going to throw. So, if, so if, the, if the current is going this direction, I'm going to throw my chum right here and it's going to end up being eaten by bait somewhere in that area, and that's where I'm going to throw. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. If I, if I chummed here, the bait's going to end up getting eaten somewhere where that U is, and that's out of my range. So chum smart. Be efficient. Drop it in right here. Catch bait right there. They're not going to eat it right when it hits the water. I should have told you that. They're not going to eat it right when it hits the water. It's going to take a little bit for the bait to eat it, and that's kind of where it is. Move it to the next one. So on the opposite, if the, bait, if the current's coming at you, Throw it up away from the boat and catch the bait here. Okay? Just a little hint there. All right, the next one. After the throw. There's stuff to do after the throw. And then throwing, by the way, we'll get to that. We'll get to the parts of the cast net, and I'll show you some of the loads. So after the throw, there's, there's things to, to realize, uh, mainly environmental resource protection things. Uh, I used to be an FWC officer and one of our maybe hints, another inside scoop on, on, as an officer 
the big live wells that guys have because a lot of guys just want to throw the net and they dump it in their live well and they're and they're done well there's other fish in there I pulled that out of my live well the other day that's a speckled trout that's about six inches long that's a second degree misdemeanor in the state of Florida little snapper little snook I've caught a little snook if those guys that just throw it and dump it in their live well and don't look as an officer, we used to check those live wells. And if it was a slow month, we could make some good cases, off, and, and you didn't even know about it. So I use a tray like this. We, I think we sell them downstairs. Just a plastic tray you could use. Some guys bring out uh, recycling bins or whatever, and you dump it in that and kind of use that as a sorting tray. You don't want, you know, if you're just going for the scaled sardines and you want ballyhoo and, you know, pinfish, then you can kind of weed them out there before you dump them in the, in the live well. All right. The other thing is your live well. Your live well does have an, a maximum occupancy for bait. You can overload your live well. And, this, and at the same time, you can actually, and I've done it down there in Charlotte Harbor, we do it all the time, you catch bait in one spot, and when you run it up to in the back country, the, the oxygen in the water changes, and you can actually kill your bait. If you don't ease your way, it's kind of the same thing when you go buy a goldfish, to put it in your aquarium at home, you got to keep it in that bag first and let it acclimate to the environment before you release it. Same thing with your bait. If you catch bait off the beach and run it all the way up to the back country, the oxygen in the water, the temperature of the water is different. It could kill the bait. It could shock the bait and kill the bait. So you don't overfill the bait or your live well and don't introduce them in dr dramatic different areas too soon. Um, that's it. Right, next one. So now we'll talk about casting. So we've, we've figured out where the bait is. We've found the bait. Uh, we've caught the bait. We've gotten rid of all the illegal fish that we've caught too, and we're safe. Uh, so now we're going to talk about how to actually throw the net. Cast nets um, are just like some, some guys have too many rods. I have too many cast nets. I counted the other day. I have like 12 cast nets in my, in my shed. My wife is like, what are you doing? I don't know. That's, I, I got you. Got to have one for every every day. You know? um, they can they they can be they come in all sizes and shapes. Um, the components of the cast nets. If you go, we'll, we'll start from top to bottom with this. The net material. This is a chart of the material and the diameter. Just so you know, the the different meshes are actually the bigger the mesh, the thicker the monofilament of the net. Um, typically you're going to be catching bigger bait so you can go and use thicker monofilament. And this is a chart for that. So this is a half inch squared mesh net. So it's made out of 0.33 millimeter mono, which is about 11 pound test monofilament. But you can see as you go smaller with the net, the pound test gets, gets smaller. And as you go bigger, the pound test gets bigger. Um, you want to match the net up with what you're doing. If you're fishing out the bridge, like you're talking about, a small quarter inch mesh net isn't going to work out there because it's going to sink slower. It won't get to the bottom fast enough. And you, you can picture that in your mind by you know, pushing your hand through water. If your fingers are closed and you go to push it through the water, it's going to be harder. If you open your fingers up wide, it's going to be easier. So the same thing with the mesh. The smaller the tinier mesh, it's going to slow the sink rate of the, of the, of the net. The bigger the mesh, it, it'll sink faster. So the deeper the water, you want to use a, a bigger mesh, but you want to match that mesh with the bait. Obviously, what you'd say, well, why don't you just use, a, you know, five eights everywhere? Well, if the bait isn't big enough to get caught in that net, you're going to get them all gilled out in the net, and then you're going to kill a lot of the bait. So you want to match it up to where you get the right sink rate, and it's going to catch the bait that's there and not, and not gill it out. Um, size of the bait, same thing, strength of the material, and then square versus stretch. You'll hear people call this net a half inch. Some people call it a one inch. And what they're talking about is the mesh. We have a marker. The mesh is a diamond shape. Square measurement is just one, one side of that diamond. And the stretch is from top to bottom. So that net is a one half squared. So this is one half inches. And then this would be one inch top to bottom. So sometimes, you know, if, if you're talking to a guy and they're saying, oh, yeah, I'm throwing my half inch net on the flats. For, for white bait. And you're like, really? And you bring this half inch net out there and you're gilling everything because he was talking about a quarter inch net. 
he was talking about his half inch stretch net and but it's actually a quarter inch so I always try to get it when I'm talking cast nets with customers I always, I'm always like all right what are we talking about are we talking about square or stretch because it's very uh, the old timers talk about stretch all the time but now the new guys are are talking the younger guys talk talking squared so try to get the get them on the right page I guess. Um, so the hand line this is the hand line the hand line's usually made out of braided hollow braided polyethylene rope so ski rope and that's because it floats um, usually 20 feet is normal this net this is our new net that we just built it's called the humpback cast net this is a 30 foot line so this would be a good good length to throw in deeper water the horn and the swivel that's that's the horn is this part of the net the swivel is obviously a swivel um, there's different types of horns and different types of swivels this horn on the on our humpback is a separation horn so what that does is keeps these braille lines, which we'll talk about next, we'll, it keeps them organized and instead of twisting up. Because this net's going to have, you know, twist in it. When you throw it, there's going to be some torque on it when you pull it in. This, bra this horn just kind of keeps all these brails organized so they don't twist up. Whereas a traditional horn, like the one on the left, allows, it, allows the brails to go in and out and sometimes they twist up. So over time, once the monofilament breaks down in the brails, we see a twist a lot. Um, the swivel, this is a 12-aught swivel. Typically, you only see 10 knots on cast nets. We went up one size and made a, a big, big heavier swivel on this. We also, our bait buster cast nets, um, we have, this is called a dragon head swivel. And what it is, is all these braille lines are all tied individually around that piece. And then this blue cap screws down on top of it. And what that's for is, you can see all these brails are all tied together to this. If I were to go get hung up on the bridge, like, like we want you to, uh, and I pop a braille line or a braille line rips, I have to replace all of them because they're all tied together in this net. With the dragon head, if I were to break one or pop one, I can just replace just that one, and I can do it on the fly while I'm on, while I'm on the boat. It's 80 pound test. Or this is 100 pound test, but the bait busters are 80 pound test. What the braille lines do, that's a good, for those of you don't, that, that don't know, that's a good picture of when you pull the net closed, all the braille lines are attached down at the lead line and they all come together and make a big purse like that. And that's what they're doing. Um, there's some nets out there that are called bag nets and they don't have braille lines. They're built out wide on the bottom and just sit on the bottom and the fish go and swim in the bags and you got to go up, wait out there and pull them in. It's really, it's an old Spanish Cuban technique. They usually use for mullet. Um, but yeah, that doesn't have braille lines. You hardly ever see those anymore. The selvage is the, where the mesh meets the horn and where the mesh meets the lead line. The two stress points in the net where you get, get pulled in from the braille lines and where you're thrown from. What we did and, and, and others do with their nets on, this, on the humpback here is it's what we call double selvage. So the last four meshes tied to the lead line and the first six meshes are doubled monofilament. So it's two strands of monofilament that we tie and, and, and tie into the webbing. So it doubles the strength of your two stress points in the nets. Uh, tape nets is something that's used really only in the Jacksonville area of Florida. And what it is, is this is a picture of it. It's a ribbon sewed in just above the lead line. And what that is, is for shrimp. There's a big shrimp run that comes out of the St. John's River in the fall, and these guys throw cast nets on the shrimp. And the shrimp are in deeper water. They don't need the net to sink fast because they're shrimp. They're not going anywhere. They're, they're just drifting with the tide. That tape allows the net to stay open as it sinks because the net naturally wants to close as it's sinking. But with the tape, it prevents it from closing and lets it go all the way down the bottom as wide as possible. So we, we were making them at, at, at a time, and it's a very specific net that's used one or two months out of the year in only one part of Florida. So it wasn't worth uh, us keeping up with it. But there's local guys now that you just bring them a regular cast net that you bought, and they'll sew a tape in. So if you hear people talking about tape nets, that's what they're talking about. All right. The lead line is where the lead goes, obviously. Um, there's different types, the round leads and the long leads. You'll hear captains get in bloody arguments over which is better. Uh, it's personal preference. I don't know that there's one that's better suited for any other situation. Some people say that the round leads 
tangle up on themselves when they're hanging. What we did to prevent that on this humpback is we, and you can see it better in that picture, we took another strand of rope and tied it tight down across the top of all the leads to lock them in so they can't slide up and they can't cross over themselves. So that's, uh, that's really the only downside of the, of the round leads. Uh, some guys like them, they think they open better. The long leads is a traditional, like the one on the top left, a traditional type of lead used in the cast nets. Um, chain is, is a, they actually just tie chain. Usually you see that in the Mississippi, Louisiana area, and they're, that's because they're throwing on a lot of oysters, and that chain helps from getting hung up. You're just throwing chain on it, and you can pull it off, um, and it's heavy, so they can get it down, catch a mullet, things like that. Again, another specific area of the country that uses it for a specific case not typically seen in our part of, of Florida. And then throwing it. Um, it's not about how hard you throw, it's about how you throw. And that, that's, uh, that's true you know, as much as it can be. The technique, it's just like a golf swing. I, I compare it to a golf swing. It, you have to have practice and then once you see someone do it, they make it look easy because it's all about the technique, it's all about the load and, and everything that goes into it. So it's not about how hard you can throw. If you get a big 12-foot net and you think you need to yoke it out there, you don't, it's, it's all about the technique and practice. Um, prep your cast net, It'll make it easier to throw and easier to load. The setup is just as important as the throw. Like I said, when you go to set this net up, when you go to load this net, and I'll show you in a second, if it's all twisted and you know doubled up on itself and the lead line's all tangled up, and you go to throw and it doesn't open, well, that's why. The setup is just as important. Take, take your time. The bait might be there. You might be nervous. We got to get it. We got to get it. Take that extra second to make sure the net and all the lines are straight and, and nothing's tangled, and it, it'll help you open it up better. Um, also, to go with prepping, uh, uh, downy fabric softener is, is used to soften the monofilament, and I would suggest even if you buy one that's brand new, to do that and maybe to do it once or twice a year where you're just going to take a bucket, you're going to take a couple capfuls of downy, pour that in there and soak your, soak your net for a few hours. You don't need to do it for two or three days, just a few hours, then rinse it off and that, that fabric softener will get in the monofilament and make it softer and that softer net will help it open. The net will open itself. A well-built net is made to open, it wants to open, and, and if you set it up right, all you're really needing to do is get the momentum going and the weight will open itself. Uh, go outside and practice, throw over and over again until the net opens every time. Practice, 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 like, like I said, it's a golf swing. Go to the, if you're gonna go to the range, go out in your front yard, and keep throwing and keep throwing. Everybody, I can tell you how to hit a golf club, but you need to go out and everybody's swing is gonna be different, just like everybody's casting. I can teach you how to load the cast net, but you're going to throw it a little different than anybody else. So you have to make it your own, figure it out, and practice. And then the last one is practice some more. I can't emphasize it enough. So the two loads that I use, one is, for lack of a better term, we call it the Calusa style. I'm right-handed, so the, the lead line's going to go on my left hand, or the float, or hand line. I'll coil it up. Small coils, not too long, but not too small. And then I'm going to grab it, grab it at the horn. I'm going to come down to about my waist, maybe a little above my belt, and grab it again with this hand and hold it up. And then I'm going to take half the weights. Now you can do that one or two ways. I, I'll throw it around my, my leg like that, or you can just come in what another captain calls harping, which is kind of like you're playing a harp, and just pull about half the weights. And then you're going to take that and roll it over your thumb and let it hang there. Just leave it just like that. Roll it over your thumb. And then that creates a high pile of weights and a low pile of weights. On the outside where the high pile meets the low pile where the lead line goes down, grab that and either put that in your mouth or you can hang it over your shoulder if you don't want to put it in your mouth. Don't put the lead in your mouth. That's, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't make a slide for that because I didn't think I needed to. Don't put the lead in your mouth. Put the, put the rope in your mouth or hang it over your shoulder or your arm. Um, for the purpose of this so I can talk. I'll put it in my mouth, but I'll hang it on my shoulder so I can talk. Sorry, Wes, if that could bust your microphone up. And then I'm going to take where the lead line now goes down and meets the high pile. I'm going to put that in my pinky, just like that. And I'm going to roll what's in my hand back into the palm of my hand. 
just like that. So now I'm ready to throw. And you can see the net's basically open for more or less. And all I'm going to do is just get the momentum going and open it up. Now when I throw, the technique to throw, I, it's kind of like throwing a bucket of water, I tell people. When you go to throw a bucket of water, you're not going to follow through as much as you want because the water's going to come back at you. You're going to get it out and get it going, and then at some point you're going to stop and let, let Mother Nature take over from there and get the bucket of water out. People say, oh, I throw a cast and you throw it like a Frisbee. Well, you don't really want all that torque on your waist and all that twisting motion. All you want to do is just swing it like a pendulum, get that weight going in one direction, and then at some point let go when that momentum reaches the point. And all that's going to come in practice. You're going to know when to let go. You're going to know, you know if, you, if you've overthrown it, underthrown it, all that. But at some point, it's more of like throwing a bucket of water than it is like throwing a Frisbee. If you can kind of get that in your head as you're practicing. The other load, the triple load, is what I use. I'm not a very tall guy, so when I throw a 12-footer, I use a triple load. And that basically is what is just separating the net in three. So what I'm first going to do is get about a third of the weights in my hands. And actually, try to take, we hold it up here. I'm going to try to take that third more from the back of the net than the side of the net. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to wrap it on, over my elbow and hang it up on my shoulder, just like that. Now I'm going to come down, and what, of what's left, I'm going to take another third of that. I'm going to take my pinky and grab that lead line with my pinky, and then the rest of, what's, of that mesh that's hanging with my palm, just like that. If you wanted to grab a little more, you could take it, put it in your mouth first, and then with your pinky like that. And now you can see that net, that net's almost completely open right now. So all we're going to do there is just go get the momentum going and toss it out there. The last part that's going to leave you will rip off your shoulder. If you guys want to, the guys downstairs are really good. They have demo nets that we can go out in the parking lot and throw, um, you know, and, and, and practice. And, and they're really good down there. Mike Cole down there can throw a 14-footer and pancake it every time. Jason, yeah. you have this on YouTube? I, I don't, but YouTube has, yeah, all these styles are on YouTube, hundreds of them. Yeah.